Okie doke. So the chatterbox is back. Um, I know another comment I've gotten is less talking, more painting. Um, but you guys are actually acting kind of like therapists for me. It helps me to get out of my out of my head and to find find my footing again, being able to talk. I feel like I should pay everybody who watches these videos. I can't. Let's keep that in mind. But it's really helped me to build um, my ability to form thought and communicate, or it helps me to keep the ability to uh, form thought and communicate on somewhat of a track. Now that I've ripped the Band-Aid off and told you about uh, my concussion, I do feel a little bit better. I've been trying to mask the issue of uh, concussions that have been repeated. I mean, I've had them several times. One of them lasted well over a year. I have a scar on my uh, skull and I cracked, uh, I cracked my skull open and on, on a ceiling fan while doing a mural, uh, it's kind of dumb, but my seven year old, cause I bent over, I saw a brush I had been looking for all day long and I went, oh look, there it is and bent over and hit my head on a ceiling fan that was in the middle of some scaffolding uh, that I was using to do a, a mediocre uh, mural of, um, of like an angelly woman in a, you know, in a flowy dress. This was years ago when I hadn't really found um, intent or drive or a voice really, uh, not drive, but a real voice of my own. I, uh, I did this mural who, for people who turned out to be drug dealers, which was really fun. They were the largest heroin dealers in New England at the time. So I found out uh, when I cracked my skull open and almost bled to death on this scaffolding. Uh, uh, the police came in, they ran through the house. Like, I know, I couldn't even see what was going on. There was blood in my eyes, blood on the floor, blood all over the scaffolding. My seven-year-old uh, called the, called 911, called the ambulance, and uh, my then seven-year-old son, and uh, he saved my life. I would have bled to death if that had happened a second later. The story is, I was up there, looked for the brush, I mean, looked down, saw the brush. This steel-bladed ceiling fan smacked my skull. There was no air conditioning in the house. It was very hot, so I had the ceiling fan going, bent over, went, oh, look, brush, boink, picked it up, whack, boink. Uh, the ceiling fan, the steel blade broke off um, when it hit my head. That's how, that's how hard we hit cracked my skull open, blood everywhere. My son at the time was headed out uh, the back door. I was like, I'm so tired of dealing with a seven year old. I just needed to think. And I mean, selfish and, and stupid, but he had to be with me. Um, and thank God he was, cause he, he started out the back door. I'm like, go oh, play on the trampoline. And he literally, he had opened up the back door had one foot out when this happened. Which direction? No, he was facing the other direction. Anyway, when he was looking at me, and no, he was facing this direction. And he just happened to look up when he saw the blade break off and sparks fly. And he said, Mom, you okay? And I went, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at my hand, no blood no blood, and then on the third try, blood just started pouring out, gushing out. Um, he called 911, he kept me awake until they got there, and the next thing I knew, there's police and ambulance and firemen all over the place, and they're trying to help me get down, and I don't, I kind of remember, but I don't remember a lot, mm, but the, the, um, the bottom line is, I had a concussion for well over a year, I had blood in the front of my face, so I looked like a Klingon, um, but if it weren't for my son, I, I would have bled to death there all alone. Uh, so that resulted in memory loss. I couldn't remember how, how to do things like, this sounds dumb, but jump. Uh, I'd be walking and I couldn't remember how to walk. Uh, I couldn't remember what a telephone was. And I had to do this all on my own and without insurance. Uh, I had to relearn all these things because I, I couldn't afford any help at all, medical help. I did see a neurologist 
it was uh, over a year later. And that was an interesting story that I won't share with you. But uh, he said, you know, when did this happen? You, you still have a concussion. I tore the uh, nerve in this eye, the optic nerve in this eye, so I have a hard time seeing out of it. Uh, I was already having vision trouble where my eyes don't cross correctly. I know they look cockeyed and cross-eyed, but they don't cross correctly, so I can't see really. That's why I can't draw or paint small. Uh, I can't see. I can't see to do it. Um, I see multiples whenever I'm looking, whatever I'm looking at, there are multiple images of, of whatever the subject is or object is. Like I'm looking at a basket. I'm not sure how many images I see of it because they're constantly moving. And that explains the way I paint and the way I draw. Uh, it explains why my paintings are oftentimes blurry and feel like they're moving. Uh, from what I understand, it's because I can't can't see them particularly well. We do the best we can. These are cheater glasses, um, and, and the subscription for them keeps going up. I can't afford regular glasses, so I'm kind of effing up my eyes with these things. But that concussion, regardless, that concussion resulted in um, a serious brain injury and uh, loss of words, loss of, loss of um, a lot of things. And an intense focus, I lost anger for the most part, and it, it developed this intense focus in me, like on, on drawing painting, that is somewhat uncontrollable. And it's, I feel it deeply down, my, down to my soul. But so now that that little cat's out of the bag, I'm gonna start carrying index cards with me. I, o I always have things written on index cards, but I'm gonna just start not hiding them. They're actually taped. There's a bunch of them taped to the camera, taped to the iPad and to the uh, O-ring around the iPad, the lighting ring. Uh, so I'm just gonna start doing this so I don't lose my track now that everybody knows. It's also led to recognition of um, intense PTSD, where if I'm being spoken to harshly, yelled at, or targeted, which is um, an event that happened again recently and sent me into an 18 month tailspin, uh, I sometimes can't think what to say or how to react. And I think my face is saying one thing a lot of times and it's saying something else, but it'll send me into a PTSD attack that can last for a very long time. And I've heard from people who also suffer from PTSD from abuse, from abuse or environmental um, problems or situations rather that that have deeply affected them and it because of the head injuries I go right back there so when I'm aggress when I'm approached aggressively there is a period of time where I just go I understand because I, I I'm just like I gotta think it through am I hearing what I'm hearing and am I hearing, am I actually hearing my past? So I stay very quiet, just kind of stare, which I've also been told by abusers is very creepy. Well, here's an idea, don't abuse people and it won't get creepy. So anyway, um, we were talking about uh, predictability, evolution, um, how I wanted to do my boys on uh, hobby horses, but I didn't want to keep approaching them in the same way. Uh, we were talking about dabbler as opposed to professional. And I explained in the last video that I believe part of being, actually what I meant to say was part of being a professional is being able to evolve. 
But as one viewer said, I believe her name is Bonnie, where's my pencil? Um, there it is. All right, as Bonnie said, uh, uh, she was told by an art teacher that uh, being a professional means selling your artwork. And yeah, that's, that is true as well. Not holding on to, as, and I'm quoting her, not holding on to every piece like it's precious. So I believe that is part of it as well, which I kind of forgot to mention. I'm so glad that I told you guys about the head injury, because honestly, it's been way, weighing on me for a very long time. That's why I forget days and names and... Then sometimes later I'll find my notes and go, oh crap. Or I'll look at videos and I realize, I watch these videos and I realize I was halfway through a thought or introduced a thought and then walked away from it. Uh, as in yesterday, I was talking about, I mentioned Toulouse Lautrec and how he was my favorite artist uh, growing up and it's going to lead to what I'm doing now. But I went on a, another Van Gogh tangent. When I was, especially in high school, I became completely obsessed with Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, part of it, part of it was his character. He was a drunk and a drug addict, and and he was uh, he had physical issues uh, because he, number one, he fell down, he fell off a horse and broke a, most of the bones in his body and that stunted his growth. And then at another point, he fell down a flight of stairs and broke, um, broke a lot of bones in his body again. So that stunted him mentally, emotionally, as well as, of course, physically. He became a drunk, a drug addict, as I said. But he also transformed art in his time. He was a revolutionary. He was a pain in the ass and very strange, but also a revolutionary in the art world. He took uh, advertising and poster art as I understand it, and made it into a true art form. His poster, he's most famous for his posters of the Moulin Rouge, as well as the horse races, but uh, he was drawn to characters like Yvette Gilbert, who was a stage uh, performer, had very unusual looks. He was from an aristocratic family, but he rejected the, the status, went his own way. And became a songbird of Paris in the late 1800s. He showed Paris, uh, he showed the underbelly of Paris and the people who actually made Paris beautiful through their own cultures. And they were outsiders. Characters at the Moulin Rouge, like Yvette Gilbert, the owner of the Moulin Rouge. He also painted and drew quite a bit. He was a sad character, but he was a strong, strong, strong character. And uh, what I really appreciated, especially as a kid, was his, or a, a teenager rather, a child, was his uh, absolute tenacity that he didn't stop. But he transformed um, poster art 
and made it into an actual art with his line work. And what he used to do when he was printing, printing posters, he would climb up on uh, the printing machine, whatever they were using, that one I don't remember, and he would draw out the images in oils. And no one was doing that at the time. So they were basically monoprints, singular prints, because each one had to be colored. Diff each one was colored just a little bit differently as the ink dried. And I took that lesson and applied it to some silk screens I did back in 2012. I did like 20, 19 or 20 or 21 silk screens back in 2012 and I used that philosophy. Each one is its own individual print. I didn't sell a lot of those, uh, but I give them away as gifts now. And sometimes people look at me like, oh, which happened a few weeks ago. Hmm, oh. I couldn't tell if these people were pleased or not, but also they didn't understand the, um, the drive behind them and the technique and not everybody's gonna understand everything, you know, every measure. So as you can see what I'm doing in this one, because my mind settled last night on how to handle how to go into the next part is a series of, of um, portraiture and figure work is I'm going to be using more pencil. It's something I've been thinking about doing, toying with for a long time, a long, long time, and I haven't done. You know, I'm always trying to evolve and always trying to find a new way to produce work and, and to help myself to grow. And one of the things I love about pencil is the way it captures and bounces light back to the viewer. Not on the white gesso, I find that kind of banal, but on the black gesso. So hopefully when I get done here, erasing the chalk lines that I made, it's gonna look like the figure disappears, but as you turn, boom, there's, boom! There's the pencil line. And I'm always playing with light in that way. Not lights and darks like shadowing although that is part of the game, part of the adventure. I just love the way ebony reflects light. So we will be adding oils to this. I don't think I'll be adding aerosol. I want to experiment working without aerosol in a few paintings. Like add light oils but keeping that pencil mark so you can see it. This would be fun, this is a sweater. So this would be totally fun for me to build a texture using aerosols and oils as I have in the past. I love painting sweaters. But I think we're gonna veer in a new direction. It's this way, playing with lights and darks. You know, I've been thinking about it for a very, very long time. So why am I waiting? What, what am I been embarrassed or afraid of? I don't embarrass easily, so what's the problem? Obviously, I don't. I'm out here painting in my jammies, or talking to you, rather, in my jammies. talk about things that 
other artists don't talk about. So why would I be embarrassed about showing you a new evolution, physically showing you? It's kind of silly. All right, I'm probably gonna do um, a live feed in a little bit and I'll put in my earplugs so you're not subjected to my yammering and my voice. Uh, but here's, here's one of my lists. We covered uh, Toulouse the Trek. Um, we touched on Van Gogh just a teeny weeny. Van Gogh is our hero. We're Van Goghing together. We're trying to blaze trails or find, whoop, pencil, come back or find our voice, ourselves, our new techniques by experimenting like Van Gogh. We are Van Goghing together. But I wanna bring up somebody that, I, that I've known about for a little bit, but watched a documentary on, and now I've been YouTubing her and such. And I also, I applied to her gallery because she's someone who would understand this. So fingers crossed on that. But her name is Bernice Steinbaum. Bernice Steinbaum. She was a gallerist, a curator, a tastemaker, and a collector uh, in New York. She was very big in New York. I think it was for 30 years. I, once again, I can't remember. It was a long time. And uh, she recently, ironically, moved to Miami, where Blue, Blue Egg was. They were so close to one another, Blue Egg and Bernie Steinbaum Gallery. And um, Jay, unfortunately, never met her. Uh, now he's in Fort Lauderdale. But so anyway, I'm listening to Bernie Stein, I'm gonna put this down, Bernie Steinbaum. And she said a couple of things that apply to what, what, we've, been, what we've been talking about a lot lately dabbler versus uh, professional, um, evolution, growth, blah, blah, blah. And I, I had these two quotes that I wrote down a few days ago while I was watching her once again on YouTube. Dabbler versus professional. This is what we're addressing in this quote. And I think it's wonderful. Uh, she defines one of her definitions of, of an artist is the incredible desire to make a mark. The incredible desire to make a mark. And that's what we're trying to do here. Let's make a mark. Make a mark on the world, make a mark for ourselves. Um, anyway, uh, take that for all it's worth. But she also, she was also talking about art. Ooh, that's itchy. She was also talking about art, real art, as opposed to dabbler art. And I, I just, I've forgotten that word. Eric, it's a wonderful word. So we're just going to keep using it. But dabbler art, you know, the uh, unprofessional, the hobbyist, the weekend painter, the you know, I can kind of paint a house, so I'm gonna stick with it. Uh, painter, and I'm sorry, I'm very rude and snobbish about, about things like that. But she said, as opposed to the professional who is just drive, drive, drive. And that's what we're trying to push here, is that, that passion in you to drive yourself, to produce more work, better work, constantly evolve looking at other art, looking at artists, looking around you, leaning what you can and being, oh my God, here's that word again, and I have to find another word to use. Be in, oh, I hate it. It's gonna come out of my mouth. Look around you, do, be inspired. Oh, I'm cringing. Be inspired to be better. I gotta find another word. Jesus Christmas, if I walked up to AC Moore right now, I could find it on all kinds of products, the word inspired. It, it just makes me, ugh. it gives me the willies at this point. That and the word believe. If I see that printed on one more pillow, ugh. Believe in Christmas or getting presents or something. They're both just ick worthy, icky ick. Anyway, she was talking about art. 
and this does apply to the things we've been talking about. Art has to transcend the image. Art has to transcend the image. And so that's something we've been talking about repeatedly over the years, over the seven years. It can't just be about Or it just can't be about copying the image or doing the best version of that image. Not to me. Not for real art. There are professional artists ugh, who are making money ugh, who duplicate Daffy Duck. who duplicate Andy Warhol's images, who just steal, and they're considered great, and it drives me up an effing tree. How gullible and disgusting people are to invest in that. Look, I know how to draw a copycat, you know? I know how to do a copycat image. I'm really good at it, or my assistant is, so pay me millions. It's just gross, it's just such a, gross and vile. So what we're discussing, not the bad stuff, the stuff that I hate that drives me crazy, what we're really addressing is how do we approach our art more professionally and find new ways, evolve within ourselves. So let's keep Bernice's uh, quote in mind. Art has to transcend the image. All right, I think I'm going to go shower now and um, get out of my jammies now that we've addressed this. And then we'll probably do a live feed and I will try not to chat less. It's funny because in real life I don't like talking to people. Turn on the camera, I'm suddenly chatty Kathy. Where does it come from? I have no confidence when I'm talking. No, I do have confidence when I'm talking to people, but I try to avoid it. We turn on the camera and all of a sudden, I can't shut up. I'm like a guinea pig running around a cage. Bleep, 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 bleep. Hopefully you can glean. Oh, there's the bags again. The Bugsy bags. Um, hopefully, here, we'll do a little. There. Hopefully you can glean. There's, there's my mini plastic surgery. No, we're going with bags. We're just going to cover them. Um, hopefully you can glean something helpful out of my silliness, my ridiculousness, the quotes, the babbling, uh, while we evolve Studio 120. And again, I'm looking for, um, I'm asking you, what can I do to help? Okay. Yep, I think that's kind of it. I didn't have anything else in my notes. Head injury to lose the trick, then go. Bernie's drawing with pencil. Checked it all off, babbled, hopefully made you giggle. Think I've done it all. This would make you cry, but we're not gonna do that. Not today. So time to shower chow. Chow and boink. <laughs>